He asked me to apologize. He couldn't make it. He's coming back from spring. So let me just give you some quick battling process and I want to turn over the team. So Northampton hit the height of media attention last spring when Good Housekeeping did a piece on climate adaptation around the country. And we got credited because we were doing things about street trees. We've been planting street, we've been requiring developers to plant street trees that we think will survive even with the climate change we expect in 100 years. We actually think we've done other things that might be more important than that, but that's what Good Housekeeping is about for most but it sort of highlights for us the reason we asked this team here, which is the city's done a lot of stuff about climate mitigation, uh, that is reducing carbon footprint, and we have a fairly good planning process for it. And we've done a fair number of sort of random things about climate adaptation, um, but we don't really have a clear plan for climate adaptation. So some boards do one thing that's really useful for climate adaptation, some departments do other things, but we don't really have a comprehensive framework. The point of this process is not to create a framework today, but the point is to ask an outside team. So uh, uh, we have uh, six people from around the country, different disciplines who have no dog in the fight in Northampton, to sort of come to Northampton and challenge us as we think about the framework. What should we, what's important to Northampton? What are ideas for doing? And so we had an intense process on Monday. We had stakeholder meetings. We had an evening meeting here. They've then locked themselves in the room for the last 48 hours, they're all starving and hungry uh, and sleep deprived. Um, but they're gonna sort of reflect on what they heard from the community, give us ideas that might help in terms of a framework for climate adaptation, give us sort of, you know, random ideas in terms of strategic opportunities, and then they go away and we can email them and call them if we have questions. But then it's really sort of a campus term. Um, and so we're sort of using this as, you know, ideas to, to sprinkle our process, in 2016, we're going to do a climate adaptation plan. We have, uh, we hope to get you all to come back in the process, and we get much more concrete about what exactly does it mean building on the ideas here. Um, and so the goal is by the end of 2016 to have a clear climate adaptation plan. 2017, the city is going to revise our comprehensive plan. So we wrote a comprehensive plan um, eight years ago now. By the time it's 10 years old, we want to revise it. So the plan is at sort of a, a 20 or 30 year planning horizon, but we feel like we have to revisit every 10 years. So in a year and a half, we're going to revise the plan. When we revise the plan, the climate adaptation plan will become a chapter in the larger plan. We're doing a separate pedestrian and bicycle master plan. That will become a chapter. And if those are the two things we think are weakest in the current plan, there may be other things that have to be so there's going to be a lot of public process moving forward. The problem with a comprehensive plan is it takes a year to write. And it's sort of often hard to get people to stay engaged the entire year. And so we really like this process because it's an intense three days. Some of you were involved, many of you were involved in the process on Monday. You come back today, we get the product tonight. Um, and so you get immediate, you know, impact. Um, so, without further ado, let me turn it over to Tom, who will sort of tell you about the process. They say, I hope you all stay involved with it. It's going forward. All right, thank you, Wayne. A couple of housekeeping notes here. We're going to go through a lot of stuff pretty quickly here because we want to make sure we get time to present all of our collective findings and give time for questions and answers afterwards. And on top of that, um, there's a lot of stuff we didn't put in a report today. We, we were editing ourselves because we have so much great stuff to talk about and just a limited amount of time. So one of the things we will be doing is, after this report is done, about a month or so from now, we will issue a more formal, robust report that has all the additional stuff we didn't get to talk to today, more information, more documentation, more references. And with that, uh, we can start dropping lights. Uh, and I'm, I'm gonna ask each individual to introduce themselves as they come up here, because we make sure it's uh, amplified as they do. Uh, my name is Tom Liebel, uh, I'm an architect uh, in with Marks Thomas Architects of Baltimore, Maryland. Um, the focus of my practice is integrating sustainable design principles into the adaptive use of historic structures. So I make old buildings, green buildings, and I was privileged to be the team leader uh, for this amazing group of people today. So, uh, so yes, it is integrating these uh, sustainable design principles into the adaptive use of historic structures. So I take an old building and make a green building, old factories repurposed for new uses. That's my, my spiel, and certainly there's great examples here in Northampton where that's been done as well. 
So, uh, but starting off here, this is one of the great things is in walking in here, you go to City Hall, the department is planning and sustainability. And that really says something right there that you guys get it in a way that a lot of communities don't. And so, we're going to go through a lot of things. Uh, we've not, we're, a lot of things we've not focused particularly heavily on because you guys are already doing it. And we want to focus on the stuff that you, you guys maybe haven't started thinking about yet or haven't really dug into yet. But that doesn't mean some of the stuff that's already here is not important. So, one of the basic things for those of you here the other night uh, heard me do the basic definition, definition here that sustainability is meeting society's current needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. This is very much our approach to, stay, to sustainability is a forward looking approach. We're looking at the future, we're looking to try and predict uh, to make sure that that which we're doing today is not compromising the ability of our kids and grandkids and great grandkids to have an even better life than we have. So, and one of the things also we want to talk about is, um, I'm from Baltimore, uh, and one of the things that we have done <coughs> over the years, uh, especially about 100 years or so ago, is we took great pride in our infrastructure. Um, between sewage treatment, water treatment, you know, 100 years ago, basic civic infrastructure was a point of pride of the community. And the fact you see right here, this is great, wonderful pumping station here, uh, built you know, over 100 years ago in Baltimore, amazing you know, uh, pumps in here. This is a sewage lift station. This is nothing more than an ability to sort of lift sewage up and out, flow back down by gravity to a wastewater treatment plant. But we were so proud of the fact we had a functional sewage system that we celebrated with great architecture. And to that effect, it's still here today as a wonderful icon in downtown Baltimore. If you're visiting the harbor, you see this kind of cool building. It's a sewage pumping station, nothing more than that. But, you know, it, but it celebrated how important the community thought infrastructure was. Conversely, what we found in Northampton is this is actually the pumping station at the bottom end of um, the Mill River where the kind of outfall gets pumped over the, uh, uh, over the, uh, the, the dike structure. It's not a bad little building, but you really never see it because it's tucked away behind the wastewater treatment plant. And, and even more interesting is, you know, this is sort of the town's primary way of keeping the floods out. This really interesting dike system we've built, and, and there's nothing to that gateway. It's, you have sort of the floodgates, you can kind of see them there, but there's no, sense of our arrival or importance or announcement that this is a really cool thing that's keeping the community safe. So maybe we might want to try pumping that up a little bit. So as we know, over the years, you know, Ventons had lots of floods, uh, and one of the predictions we'll be finding out momentarily here is we're going to be getting more rain events of greater intensity and more and greater frequency. So, you know, where Northampton's done a very good job over the years of building to accommodate flooding, we have to plan for more of that coming up here, or from the great 1869 flood where they took down an entire train to you see City Hall right now in the 1936 flood, you know, water lapping at the doors there. And then 1936 was clearly a significant flood here um, to the point actually that was when the tax system was constructed, but you look on the flood right there, welcome to Northampton, we're eight feet underwater. So a couple of things to think about in terms of the, the metrics here. Uh, one of the things we heard the other day was the importance of a regional approach, that while we have Northampton here, we focus most of our work here in the community, we recognize that you're reaching out to Amherst and all the other communities surrounding here, all the way down to Springfield. So one thing to think about um, here, uh, the image you see here is looking at the cost of housing as a percentage of your average income. And basically, blue is more than 30%, yellow is less than 30% of the area median income. And what you see is the area itself here is not particularly affordable. Um, so one thing we're going to look at is, in terms of improving equity, how that uh, ties back to creating more opportunities for affordable housing. What's even more interesting is where there are some patches of yellow here, which indicates affordability, when you start rolling in the impact of transportation on top of that. So one metric is 30% of housing costs is deemed affordable. You also have the metric of 45% of housing and transportation costs. And a lot of the areas that are kind of the hinterlands disappear. You spend a lot of money, a lot of effort driving around and transportation costs really start to jack up uh, the cost of your income, of, uh, have an impact on your family income. And that has a spillover effect, I'll talk about momentarily here, in terms of the broader impact on the climate. 
So other metrics to look at here. Same thing here. Uh, often, you times look at greenhouse gas emissions from the, from transportation. Uh, you look at the map here. This is kind of uh, Springfield up to uh, Northampton, and the dark areas are the urban areas, which shockingly enough means you have greater emissions of greenhouse gases in the urban areas, which one would think would be bad. Until you look at it and instead measure it off of household <coughs> emissions, then that, that inverts, because it means if you're living in a denser community, you're driving less. So actually, to reduce your impact uh, as a family, uh, living closer and living more densely is actually important to help with that. And more specifically, getting into Northampton more properly, you see here, here's the Northampton area. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions per acre are concentrated right around the downtown area, but those are also the only places that have anything less than a significant impact in terms of emissions. Other metrics to look at here. Um, it should be somewhat intuitive as well too, but this is a uh, image of a compact neighborhood score. The darker the image, the more compact the neighborhood, the more of a mixed use, walkable community it is. And shockingly, when you look at that, aligned with this is a reduction in vehicle miles traveled. So if you live in a walkable community, uh, odds are you're driving less. And that has a you know, profound impact on our collective impact on the climate. So a couple of things we want to talk about here. Uh, a lot of things you do well. Things like, what are the alternatives to driving everywhere? Walkable communities. Talk a minute about that idea of a walk score and the fact that Northampton, uh, in certain areas, ranks really well. That you have a very walkable community in many places here. Bike infrastructure, same thing. That you guys have actually done really, really well in terms of promoting a bikeable environment. And that really is, is a helpful thing. Other things we need to be looking at as well, though, is you know, bus transit does not seem to be as as robust as it could be here. Can we find ways to promote that? But as we're doing it. What can we do in terms of buses that are hydrogen powered, electric powered, biodiesel powered, something other than a you know, standard gasoline powered uh, bus? <clears throat> Rail transit, if we're talking about a regional uh, interaction between all these communities, then maybe a regional rail system might be something to investigate to get more people around more efficiently. Other things to look at that we're just starting here, um, car sharing. If one of our goals is to uh, reduce <coughs> reliance upon indi uh, individual driving automobiles, and you've been able to reduce, eliminate a lot of your need to drive around through a walkable community, a bikeable community. Then, from those times to time that you actually do need to drive someplace, don't own a car, you know, rent a car, borrow a car, and car sharing is a great way to do that. Zipcar program has started uh, here in, in Northampton. Uh, it's a great start, and I, I'm guessing you're going to see more and more of that. And as we're planning for the future, something we should start accommodating are things like the idea of autonomous vehicles. Everyone's heard about you know, Google's driverless car. As that starts to come to fruition, and predictions are sooner than we think, potentially within five years, the need to consistently focus on where we're going to put the cars, how we're going to park the cars, how we're going to drive my car around town, might start to go away if the model is, rather than I'm driving my car to park in downtown, is I'm gaining access to a car to be brought to downtown and the car disappears uh, as a service and goes uh, to take care of someone else. And furthermore, as we're moving forward into the future, I have to start looking at things about what are the technologies we can't predict for now. One of the ideas of future proofing is we don't know what's coming next. And so from that standpoint, you know, autonomous cars are the next prediction, but what, you know, jetpacks, we don't know in the future. So we need to make sure that as we're planning for infrastructure in the future, uh, that we're not restricting the opportunities uh, for future uses until we are, of course, condemned by robot overlords. Anyway, uh, talking about walk score. I think what I was a little shocked is that walking around Northampton uh, is that you think it had a higher walk score than it is. Does everyone know about walk score and what it is? No. <laughs> It is a metric that measures the walkability of the community, and it's based on access to the necessities you need in life. Uh, you know, schools, shopping, employment, doctor's offices, <coughs> banks, all that kind of good stuff. And, and it sort of can measure that. And looking at the community in a whole, ranks of uh, 39, scales 0 to 100. 39 is not awesome. If you actually label it, you see it's labeled as a car-dependent city. But one of the reasons for that is because the community is not just the downtown areas and Florence and Leeds. It captures a great deal of the country uh, around here, including you know, some farmland. And in doing that, even 
this broad area, it's marked much, uh, that Northampton is rated much higher in terms of bikeability. It ranks 69, which is actually fairly high. It's actually marked as a, uh, as a bikeable community. And that's great, because that says even the most remote places, you still have some access uh, to bicycle infrastructure. And I will say Northampton is one of the very few places I've ever seen in the country that the bike scores tend to be higher than the walk scores. That's kudos, that shows that you guys have really worked a great deal to promote bicycle infrastructure. Once again, it's done. that's not bad. However, you start looking at it, let's talk about City Hall, kind of at the, the home of Main Street, there, um, down on Main Street there. You actually have a walk score of 94 and a bike score of 97. That, that's a walker's paradise. I mean, that's really, really impressive because if you live in that, that area, you really don't need a car. And from that, you see the metrics here, what gives you a 94? You have universal access to all the needs uh, you have to live right now. Schools, retail, um, shopping, you know, everything, uh, employment. Coming down the little hill a little bit here, even into right around the corner here, I picked Service Center Road as a random point, kind of near the south end of the, uh, the city here. You still get a variable walk, very walkable score of 80 and a very bikeable score of 79. You still have access pro in proximity. You can walk from here to a lot of things. You might be up the hill a little bit, uh, but still very, very walkable. Then we move out towards Florence. And once again, here's the general access you have to, to things here. Moving towards Florence, um, it's somewhat walkable because once you have a little bit of denser, denser concentration at the intersection up there, um, somewhat walkable, but still very bikeable. Uh, Biker's Paradise, the ranking in 91, you have such great infrastructure up that way. And just kind of figure out how we got to that, that 39, that low number overall. I tried to find a place that was really remote. And if you get out towards the reservoirs, you end up with a walk score of six. This kind of shows, shows you when you're really, really far away, you know, there's, you really can't walk to anything out that way. But even then, you know, you've got a bike score of 41. So that kind of shows you have limited access to anything but parks and schools uh, out that way. So other things to think about in terms of what we can do to reduce our impact, but also provide a greater a ability and adaptability to look at future climate change. One of the ideas is we don't have to travel as much. Uh, that also means that if we have more and more climate events where it's getting difficult to travel, we can be closer by here. So certainly, as I said, one of the things I focus on a lot is the adaptive use of historic structures. How can we repurpose some of the things uh, that aren't fully utilized to new uses? So things like creating incubator spaces. Uh, right now you have a very active retail environment down the first floors, uh, a lot of spaces down along Main Street. Upper floors, some going to be kind of empty, not maybe not particularly utilized. So rather than that being empty space, can we just start looking at trying to create centers for incubation, trying to help local uh, businesses grow? And once they've grown and done quite well, what about graduation space? So once once your your, your startup starting to do well, where you go is always a big question. If you don't plan for growth, plan for the ability for businesses to um, grow, they end up moving someplace else. And the goal is to keep people. Well, keep you know keep these great hometown uh, ideas local. Other options is acceleration space. You know, the key to it is basically there are about 27 different flavors of co-working space. Be mindful of what they are and try and find ways to promote promote that to help activate your downtown and provide good jobs uh, for your citizens. And then also on top of that, don't forget in addition to kind of the technical uh, workspace, also maker space. Once again, people are trying to figure out ways to create things. I understand that college has a makerspace. Uh, it's a growing trend we're seeing that it provides the ability to um, manufacture things locally here. With that, I'm that initial uh, uh, introduction here, I'm going to hand off to Rachel. I'll let her talk about what she's going to talk about. I can't hold a mic and talk at the same time, so I'm going to. Hi everyone, I'm Rachel Gregg. I'm a lead scientist at EcoAdapt, um, and I work exclusively on climate change adaptation. So I'm not saying that you have to listen to what I say more than what anybody else up here says, but that's up to you. <laughs> um, and I, you know, apologies to Red Sox fans. Oh, oh thanks. <laughs> apologies to Red Sox fans for quoting a Yankee in your house, but um, Yogi Berra was really a great modern philosopher. So the future ain't what it used to be. He wasn't talking about climate change, but it does fit in this instance. 
we can't really rely on past practice anymore to think about how, how climate change is going to affect our future decisions. Mm -hmm. So we have to think long term in order to minimize our risk and maximize our success. Part of our conversations on Monday, we're talking about specific impacts to the area and some concern that people didn't really understand what, what exact impacts would be. I'll get part of the, this process is we're going to go home and write a report and I've been promised that I'll have more space in there and we're going to expand on a lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk about. But just in general, we are going to see changing temperatures and changing precipitation patterns here. That's going to mean a couple of things for you all, some, some of which you've already seen. Increased heat waves, increased fitness for some species, both positive and negative, beneficial and harmful. Altered range of plants and timing of bloom, blooms and pollen production. We had a couple of people mention that their doctors actually told them that uh, their allergies were getting worse because of climate change, and that's the first time I've ever heard of a doctor actually giving that as a prescription um, or a, a, a diagnosis. Um, precipitation, increased flood risk, of course, increased damage to property and infrastructure, increased drought and fire risk, and increase in waterborne diseases and threats to water quality. Because I want to reflect a little bit on some of the community conversations we had on Monday, we did talk quite a bit about challenges and strengths that Northampton faces. Um, I've tried to capture a lot of these here. The important ones, obviously, climate change is the, isn't the only challenge that Northampton is dealing with. There's limited resources, budgetary constraints, those political, economic, social, and institutional issues, and in some cases, disparities that people are really concerned about. Uh, understanding what climate risks are going to affect you and identifying specific responses, alleviating dis disproportionate effects on the most vulnerable citizens, generating sustaining political uh, a public interest and political will over time, coordinating efforts throughout the city and the region and to try and, and also trying to communicate and engage with the public. But the opportunities here is that you have a really passionate and engaged community. Um, you, you all are agents of change and you have leaders like Wayne and your mayor who are really interested in furthering the, the climate response efforts here. And also context matters, you're an expert on your neighborhood and community, and we really appreciate all of the time and effort you guys have put into this effort so far. So on Monday, we asked a couple of people, we asked our folks to sort of designate what their primary sectors and subsectors are. Um, these are the, the, the main ones that we came up with, the built environment, natural environment, social environment. The architects and engineers got the opportunity to play around with the built environment, so they're going to be providing a lot of those interesting diagrams and sketches for some ideas you can look forward to um, or, or potentially incorporate. I'm going to talk a little bit about the natural environment recommendations, and Judy is going to talk about the social environment. So real quickly, uh, Wayne actually mentioned this already. So what we need to do is have an overall comprehensive climate response strategy. That means it's both mitigation and adaptation. And adaptation, it's important to note that that's also, that's not only decreasing negative effects, but also taking advantage of potential opportunities. So there's a lot of climate adaptation planning frameworks, and this is just one example. What's important to note is that you want to think about what impacts are going to be most important to your community and identify what your most vulnerable sectors and resources are so that you can plan appropriately. And Northampton, like Wayne has said, has taken strides to address some of these steps, but not really in a cohesive or comprehensive effort so far. So one of the first suggestions is that it's really important for Northampton to build and maintain support for climate action. So one of the things we talked about a little bit on Monday was identifying a climate response champion and also identifying a stakeholder advisory committee. So one of the first recommendations is to have Northampton and have your mayor sign the Compact of Mayors, which is a global agreement, to do a couple of things. Inventorying your greenhouse gas emissions, inventorying your climate hazards and risks, creating vulnerability reduction targets, and then creating an action plan that includes both mitigation and adaptation measures. The second recommendation is to conduct a community vulnerability assessment. So climate vulnerability refers to the extent to which a resource, a community, or a process is susceptible to harm from climate change impacts. So it helps you figure out what things are most vulnerable and why they're vulnerable. And so vulnerability assessments are tools that can help you prioritize resources, can help you develop strategies, and it can help you efficiently allocate your resources. 
So when we talk about reducing vulnerability, we talk about reducing your exposure, reducing your sensitivity, and increasing your adaptive capacity. So as far as exposure goes, that's things like climate impacts that you're already experiencing or you expect to experience, but also the non-climate stressors that may affect your response to climate change. So things like non-point source pollution, runoff, um, uh, habitat degradation, et cetera. For reducing sensitivity, you want to think about what aspects of Northampton, whether it's people, your infrastructure, your functions will be affected and how. And increasing adaptive capacity, you want to think about what resources exist that could be used to address climate change. A lot of people talked on Monday about not being sure about how to prioritize the impacts to address because there are a lot of things going on besides climate change. So I just tried to provide some guiding questions that I'll expand upon a lot more in the report. But one of the things is to, to really use the results of vulnerability assessment to try and identify what assets are most vulnerable and why. To try and prioritize win-win strategies. So are there current problems that have to be addressed and are expected to get worse with climate change? To look for the low-hanging fruit. So are there actions that are particularly low cost or quick to implement? And then to, to really take into account how much these things cost. And then finally, developing and implementing your climate response plan. There's a lot of tools to help you figure out how to do this. I'm sure Wayne has them all collected. But you want to create the plan, have actions, have timelines assigned to those, have responsible parties and public involvement in the process, and identify your available and needed, and needed resources. You also want to make sure you do some community ground truthing with the plan, so you all need to be involved as well, because you can help assess the feasibility, equity, and effectiveness of these proposed actions. And so one of the things that I did over the last day or so was try to review a couple of existing city plans and policies to see where I could re recommend some additional tactics to explore. Um, obviously, there will be more detail in the report, but as far as natural systems go, um, for, for folks who engage in targeted land acquisition, like the city, or maybe even some private property owners, you may want to start thinking about including climate change in those acquisitions. So could you include vulnerable lands that are identified in the assessment? You may want to consider considering uh, the amount and type of land cover. So a healthy and intact forest is not the same as a soccer field when it comes to adaptation benefits protecting and maintaining wetland and riparian buffers, and planting flood-tolerant species. For public health, um, use the buddy system to check on elderly and other vulnerable residents. There are some areas that are using, that are having their public utilities voluntarily refrain from shutting off service during extreme heat events, encouraging mass transit use by maybe providing free rides on low air quality days, uh, limit and avoid outdoor burning, this is a picture of a girl in Washington State who did not do that, and now my state is on fire. And then also research the feasibility of hypoallergenic trees. So if pollen production is getting worse, maybe we can start planting trees here that won't be as bad. And then another issue is the agriculture and food supply um, for, for the local community. So this may already exist, but you may want to think about developing a food security plan. Uh, you may want to review crop planting to accommodate a potential extended growing season. <coughs> Agriculture may actually benefit from climate change in this area, apples specifically. You want to facilitate research on crop survivability and diversity under changing climate conditions, so things like sugar maples may not do as well. And also increase access to places and places to purchase fresh and local food. And I will turn it over to Judy. <coughs> Judy Shaw. I am a PhD researcher at Rutgers University in New Jersey, and my major areas um, as a result of my training over many years of working in environmental protection include risk uh, communication, that is working with the, the public to translate the technical jargon into common language and have a universal understanding of what is true and what is projected also to promote public participation in policy and planning, and finally to do regional planning, which I do on a watershed basis, 
uh, with 98 municipalities and seven counties in New Jersey. <laughs> uh, I'm not bored. <laughs> it was a real pleasure, and it's nice to see so many of you again. Thank you again so much for being so passionate about this process. Climate adaptation and environmental quality planning really start with four key points because you're going to build the priorities for this collective effort. And it has to be something that you're convinced is moving in the right direction. And if you're not convinced, it's going to start to sputter. So you're very important to that process. You need to create a shared understanding of the issues. I'm sure a lot of you were surprised by much of the information that was presented to you because you don't have a full understanding of it yet and you don't have a full understanding of how it's going to impact you here in Northampton. That has to be something that every one of you can say, I know what this is, and this is how it's going to operate in our plan. The second one is, as uh, Rachel pointed out, is to identify and rank your vulnerabilities. These are going to be across the board. Climate has obvious impacts on natural systems and infrastructure and roads. But it also has tremendous impacts on your social lives and on your economic lives. And it's very important to in integrate all of that into the vulnerability assessment so that you begin to think collectively of how this is going to impact Northampton and how you're going to respond to it. So the creation of a strategic plan for climate adaptation, this is something that I heard over and over again. It's a regional issue. Yes, it is. And I'm going to tell you, that we are finding that uh, over and over again in New Jersey. But the value of looking at these problems together, your municipality makes a land use decision that affects our municipality, or your decision about impervious surface affects our community. Working together is going to be the key to the future. And we had, um, I don't think she's here, but I didn't look very carefully, uh, Pioneer Valley, Planning Commission? Oh, I'm here for Catherine. Oh, thank you very much. Welcome. And you rode a bike, right? <laughs> um, but they are very committed to working with Northampton because you have a reputation for setting the standard for the region. So that would be a great partner in this. And finally, building a pride of place and a sense of accomplishment. Through the discussions, we learned why you love this community. You love the schools, you love how safe it is, you love the good governance, you love the land, the farms, the bikeways, the green spaces. It's walkable and bikeable. And if I sound a little <coughs> clutched, it's because I kind of get passionate about this. Okay. So this is a meeting that we held in New Jersey. The mayor is the gentleman in the middle. Um, I'm on the right, and then the other three people are key players in the community to whom this all matters. And we're talking about restoring the floodplain in this community because they're at the low point of five communities that all are draining right down on them. And when Irene hit, they were flooded out and their municipal electric system, which they're one of the only municipalities that has their own system, it was flooded because it was in the floodplain. Once you run out of good space to build, there are a lot of people that will argue, let's just build it right here in this nice little open space and never mind about the flood factors. You need to clearly distinguish, as we mentioned already, the di between mitigation and adaptation and recognize yourselves as survivors, prepared, you're going to face what hits you and you're going to let it come and let it go and you're going to move right forward because you have developed a resilience mentality as a group. One of the key issues in ranking your vulnerabilities is just having an open discussion where people are putting up, these are the things that are, are vulnerable and problematic. Those are the, uh, the, the red signs and the, blue, the green signs are the ones that we have more structure to protect, but this begins to build that conversation and that understanding. People need to hear these messages in many ways. Workshops is a wonderful way to do it. Another way is to put it on websites. 
Um, the Kestrel Land Trust is putting a climate change uh, link on their website. The municipality has one. It's very important to use those tools and to see every organization in this community start to look at that question and say, how do we respond within our own group to the climate challenge? The other, the other way to learn about it is stories. You tell me what happened to you, I'll tell you what happened to me, and we'll take a look at how we're gonna change the way that happened next time and get past it. Continually interacting with leaders. I understand your city council members are very actively engaged in their, in their wards, which is really great. And Wayne and the mayor are out and about a lot, and as well as Wayne's staff. You've got to keep the conversation and the process on track you need to involve business leaders because these are going to be about jobs and about job preparedness, but they're also going to be about new businesses. And Tom illustrated some of those things with the incubators and the graduation of those incubators. Um, it also needs to involve the medical community. The, the doctors across this community need to be in sync with this and they need to be able to say to their patients, this is an issue, this is how you deal with it, these are the medical issues related to it. Tour the local resources. Walk around with people who know what you're looking at. These are the trees that we're looking at. These are the issues that we're facing. And this is why it's important to protect these wonderful resources. You have tremendous resources here. <coughs> Final point of that uh, group is to build the climate adaptation plan that can be a model for the region. And it's just fundamental that regional vulnerability is a factor and that's gonna be reduced by Northampton building a model that other communities can follow. General sessions with the larger community. This was great for us. Monday, Tuesday night, getting an interaction with you to say, oh, wait a minute, you're not thinking about this, or we had this problem, or why didn't you talk about that? It's wonderful. The more questions, the better. And the more questions you ask, the more stuff you get out, the stronger the outcome's gonna be for all of you. So you have to keep discussing the key issues as the community keeps building pride and ownership in the process. There will be subcommittees and smaller groups. There may be um, within organizations. It's all about how do you build on what you already have. A lot of us say, okay, well, we should have a, a street fair on this topic. Well, that's a lot of work to do that. And it may be that that's a wonderful thing to do. But look at what you already have. Look at the structures you already have. You have block groups and neighborhood associations that meet on a regular basis. How do you integrate the climate adaptation discussion into what they're already doing? How do you take the League of Women Voters or the <coughs> Conservation Council or the Tree Commission and have those conversations taking advantage of the structures that already exist? Um, Public health issues are a huge matter in all this, as was illustrated earlier. <coughs> tree canopies, another big issue. We learned that the average age of a tree, the average lifetime of a tree in Northampton is eight years. Simply because there are too many conflicting agendas. Not all of them bad, in fact, many of them good. But when you wanna have uh, photovoltaics on your roof so that you can get solar power, you got to move the trees so that you can get direct sunlight. And people just chop down the trees and they've got the sunlight, but they don't have the function that the trees provided in terms of shade or <coughs> beauty to their properties. And that's it's not exactly the right solution. So we have to figure out where the sweet spot is. Uh, this is just another picture from one of our meetings and we have to recognize that if we work together with the staff and the planning and sustainability group and asking plenty of questions, that you'll develop that common understanding of issues and solutions. The fact that Northampton has a microgrid, that's huge. Because in the middle of a storm, when people are working from generators that run on gasoline and they can't get down to get the gas, oops, you're, you're in trouble. So the microgrid, I understand, goes from the firehouse down to the, uh, what's it called? Not stop and shop, but yes. the grocery store? Yes. It's only and a vision. What's that? It's only a vision. 
It's only a vision, okay. But the idea that it will go past a bank and a pharmacy and the other key places that people are going to need to get to, keeping those things operating during a crisis is critical to all of you. Uh, the transportation issues are another one, but I'll let that sit for the moment. Another meeting where everybody had a chance to inform us about what's going on with emergency management and how the EMTs in your community work so hard and uh, so dedicated to making sure you're safe. And then uh, working with Wayne and just taking a look at this map and what that means to us and where the bikeways are and where the other um, boundaries are that, that make this community strong. Having ongoing strategic planning meetings, as Rachel showed in the diagram with the five steps in it, we have adopted a similar program in New Jersey. And the fifth step is you have to constantly revisit and say, okay, when we first started, this is where we were going and this is why we were going there. Are we still going there? Has it changed? And if we haven't changed and we're not going there, why aren't we? How do we regroup? How do we refocus? What else do we need to be thinking about? It's constantly revisiting the question, where are we and are we still on course? And that happens when you have those ongoing meetings. Oh, and by the way, I've been encouraging the mayor to convene on a quarterly basis the leaders of all the organizations in this community. You have incredible leadership out there. And once they get involved and learn about these issues and learn about how they can tie into it and become the leaders of it, it will simply get stronger and better for all of you. The last item I'm going to talk about is that pride of place and sense of accomplishment. Competition and rec recognition. Uh, those quarterly meetings that capitalize on existing programs and events, creative competitions to involve youth. It can be art projects. It can be a photo contest. It can be an essay contest. It can be a topic in the science fair. It's all about utilizing the joy of getting that kind of involvement. I had the pleasure of writing the first book on the Raritan River in modern times. We needed a lot of pictures in it. We wanted people to look at New Jersey and go, holy cow, this is a gorgeous place. We got over 900 photographs submitted. And I had to wean out of that 300, 350 in the final book. But it was astonishing to me how clearly passionate people are about the beauty of their place. And I know that exists here too. So I hope you take advantage of it and keep on pushing. Thank you. both on the AIA website under the SDAT link and you'll also see it through uh, Northampton Planning and Sustainability. Considering the, consider the illustrations that you're going to see next um, to look at addressing climate planning, urban design, green infrastructure, and energy and sign up to be part of the ongoing leadership in conversation for the strategic plan for climate adaptation. My name is Anders Breidecker, I'm uh, with uh, Evergreen Energy in St. Paul, Minnesota. And as you can hear my accent, I'm not from there originally, but I'm from Sweden. And uh, I have worked in the energy business all my professional career. That's at the, the end of the career. <laughs> uh, I'm semi-retired, but I really enjoy be, being here uh, to take uh, part of what you have here, and I'm really impressed what I've seen so far. Uh, see here. We have okay. So, <coughs> um, just a little more about my background. I have worked with, with uh, renewable energies since many, many years back way before it was kind of the thing to talk, talk about. This goes back to, to the 80s, actually, uh, when uh, we back in Sweden then were actually uh, building uh, so large solar fields. We were uh, using biomass. We were using uh, uh, waste to e energy to produce electricity and things like that. So. Uh, 
it's uh, then I moved to, to the U.S. and have been uh, uh, doing work in St. Paul, where we also have worked hard to try to convert from from being a fossil fuel based uh, company to be a renewable fuel based company. So that, that's my background. Uh, uh, <coughs> a vision for, for uh, future energy needs. Uh, first, first of all, I just have to say that uh, the city has come, as we have heard here, come a long way uh, in the planning for, for uh, mitigation climate change and, and it's it's great to see what has been planned so so far here uh, but as uh, Judy said this is it's so important to get everybody involved and uh, I'm just going to talk about the e energy part here but it's so important that both public and private and don't forget about the developers uh, that build uh, new uh, build buildings and so on. They, they are key to, to uh, how we actually can, can uh, uh, implement this. And uh, it's important that you together uh, work out a vision for how e e energy will be supplied to, to this community. And uh, I mean, you can have the vision for uh, 25 years, but try to start with, look at 10 to 15 years out, what can be done? So we take the uh, baby steps to where, where we really like to go. Otherwise it can be overwhelming and it's going to be, people say, oh, that can never be done. Uh, take it uh, in steps. And <coughs> uh, when it gets to, to the uh, energy future, then what, what is most, most important to you? Is that reliability, I mean, when you have ice storms and things, is that the most important thing? Is it affordability? Uh, because you can't get everything for, for a low price if you really like to have the highest reliability, for example. And there is a price to, to this, and uh, you have to be will, willing to, to, uh, to pay what it costs to, to put this together. Uh, I'm going to talk first a little more about, before I get, get into this slide, about the, what I have learned from uh, uh, the uh, last me meetings here and the current en energy supply here. Uh, on the electrical side, your electric price is uh, above a average for, for, for the U.S., but uh, the issues that ca came up uh, was not just price, it was reliability and seasonal price uh, fluctuations. And then uh, it was less about, that about half of it is fossil fuel based uh, when it gets to, to the electric production. And I will get back to that later. On the net gas side, the price is more in uh, line with, with uh, what we see around the country. And uh, but there we have the local dis distribution system uh, is fed from a single transmission trunk line that's uh, for sure a, 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 a threat, so to say, if something would happen to, to that uh, transmission line. And then uh, we have the same thing as for, for uh, electric prices that they are uh, the volatility over the season and from year to year. Uh, and then oil, uh, when it gets to the environmental uh, benefit of getting uh, rid of oil uh, because people are switching more and more to, to natural gas and other uh, sources like heat pumps and, and uh, biomass, and that's really a good trend. So then, uh, if we go to, to the slide here, um, it's more to look at local resources, and I'm going to concentrate on the, the things around the, the, the uh, build buildings here. It's more, what's important to start with is for sure energy conservation, energy efficiency, 
to really look at the buildings and the houses you have. What can I do to really reduce the energy I'm using by just uh, have a tighter M envelope on, on your house, for example, <laughs> or to, to put on some more insulation. Okay. And uh, then we have, <coughs> We go around, we have solar PV. I know that we have planned for, for a major solar PV in installations uh, at the landfill, if I remember right. And uh, for sure that can produce a lot of uh, local electricity. Uh, we have other things like uh, solar thermal. I haven't seen any of those here. Uh, but I can uh, just, uh, as an example, tell you what we have done in St. Paul where we, we put in uh, solar uh, thermal that takes care of a uh, major part of uh, the convention center and hockey arena uh, in, in, in St. Paul. We have organic waste that can be used together with sewage uh, to uh, produce biogas that can be used for uh, running the buses, for example, or be put into the natural gas uh, uh, dis distribution network to be used as, as a, a renewable fuel instead of the uh, fossil fuel based natural gas. Uh, combined heat and power, we heard something about the uh, the uh, smart grid, so to say, and just like you to have the background, uh, a coal-fired power plant uh, usually wastes about 65, 67 percent of the energy in the fuel. So it's only 33 percent efficient, and then you have other losses, transmission losses, on top of that. Uh, and uh, that's definitely not the way to do it if we're trying to, to reduce the, the greenhouse gases. Uh, what has happened here is that many of the coal-fired plants have been shut down and you have, uh, or it has been installed natural gas-fired plants. It's much, much better, but it's still uh, not much better than 45 to 50 percent efficiency and if you look at the combined heat and power, as you have here in town, uh, at the college, they have a combined heat and power uh, system providing the college buildings both with electricity and heat, heating and cooling. They call it tri generation because they, they can provide all three. That's a very, very efficient way of, of uh, uh, using the fuel and you can get up to about 75 percent uh, only have 25 percent waste in that case from the energy in the fuel makes a huge difference uh, compared to to the the old uh, coal fired plants this is just showing the uh, so solar thermal uh, in installation we have on top of of roofs to, to, to the convention center in, in St. Paul. It's a winter day. We get a lot of uh, good solar energy even in the middle of the winter. It doesn't matter if it's uh, 20 below as we can get in, in Minnesota. We still get uh, a lot of en energy from the sun. One thing that <coughs> um, you have heard about uh, solar PV, you have heard about a lot of other things as the heat pumps when it gets to uh, geothermal heat, for example, where you're extracting heat from, uh, from uh, drilling wells and then you can heat and cool your, your house or your building. Uh, one thing that uh, is not that common but that I'm going to talk about quite a bit here is because when I saw your, your uh, map for, for uh, the uh, waste water system here in town, then I got excited, very excited when I saw it. Uh, and because you can actually use 
the the uh, wastewater system you have in place to both extract energy from to heat your building or your house or you can dump heat into it if it's uh, if you like to have air conditioning during the summer you use the, the uh, waste water to actually provide that service and you can do it in a very very uh, environmentally friend friendly way the red lines here shows uh, the uh, the uh, wastewater system. Uh, I'm not too familiar with exactly what everything, uh, the names of it here, but where, where we have the arrow that's uh, very close to to, uh, to Main Street, and uh, or it's in the intersection of Main Street and uh, and the King Street, and these major wastewater. Uh, lines can actually be used then to provide heating and cooling services to, to the buildings. I have just ra randomly picked some here just to show you. I mean, any house or big building can be connected to this system. This is just a blow up of the, the uh, information around Main Street and uh, you have the city hall. Probably can see where city hall. It's over up here. And uh, <clears throat> what you have to install then is a, a you extract heat or cooling from, or you extract heat from, from the the uh, wastewater line, and then you have a, a clean loop, clean water loop that you actually run to each and every building. This is on at uh, Conn Street, and you have the hotels and uh, close by where, where, where we are right now. Uh, it's just an example of what can be done here, uh, that we actually could extract the heat, or we can actually, for air conditioning, reverse it and uh, dump heat into the system. Uh, this is a map showing biomass in, and this is the form of uh, actually urban wood waste. We in St. Paul are using a lot of wood waste from the Twin Cities area to uh, both produce electricity and uh, provide heating and cooling to 80% of downtown St. Paul from, from, uh, from one plant. And we're using uh, wood waste that otherwise would be put into landfills and then uh, to, to, to no use at all. In our case, we, we use it to provide this service. And we can do it on a competitive basis we're competing with natural gas, and we're competing on the electrical side uh, with uh, on-site uh, uh, chillers. And if if we look at uh, where we are right now, you can see it's it's uh, red, and that means that it's plenty of of uh, urban wood residue, not necessarily in town here, but I mean in this area within. 50 miles or so, you definitely have a lot of uh, urban waste <coughs> available that you can use for uh, biomass. I'm get, getting back to this, as you saw from, from the beginning, and I'd like to stress the flexibility of a low temperature disk energy system. Uh, and if you look at the, the uh, low temperature plant as we call it down here and what what kind of sources in the future the flexibility of this system uh, depending on what happens in the future you can use wherever you have waste heat available it could be from from uh, some organic i mean when it gets to to biogas that you then can generate electricity and then you can use the waste heat into the system you can have solar thermal. You can have you can have storage as well. 
uh, in the form of uh, water. You store water in big tanks, so when uh, you have waste heat available, you pump it in there if there is not a need for it at that time, and then you pump it out when you have a need. So with that, I think I will uh, just stress again the flexibility of a low temperature system would fit into to, uh, this community. Thank you very much. You may be tell from my accent that I'm from Massachusetts. <laughs> Not both. Uh, I'm a uh, registered professional civil engineer, um, I'm, and I'm headquartered in uh, Rentham, Massachusetts, down the road. And my specialty is in site level sustainability, that is the on the ground part of sustainability. That's what that means here. Uh, and the idea of green infrastructure. I can't hear you. You can't hear me. Okay. Um, should I tell my joke again? <laughs> So please don't. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, again, the idea of green infrastructure is, uh, we'll develop the, the ideas around uh, shortly here, uh, but I want to show you some ideas about what adaptation in uh, Northampton might actually look like. So with that, um, we have decided as a team, since we're the sustainable design assessment team, we really think that part of this is about a design and it's about design ideas and design methodologies and, and practice. Um, in addition to the wonderful and, and required policy and the public engagement part of it, um, the, the very fabric of the community matters. And we, we talked in uh, Tom's, uh, Tom's talk about uh, density and the need for density. What does that mean in terms of what it means to, to be in, in the city and, and, and to, to be of the quality that uh, we all are seeking? So uh, we have decided that we would be able to articulate a few main points regarding adaptation, design, and planning. Uh, around the demonstration project. And this demonstration project is centered at what, what we're calling the South Gateway. And this area would be south of downtown, up to the, uh, uh, the, the berm, the uh, flood levee, uh, and down to 91 beyond that along Pleasant Five. So this is our test area. It isn't to say that what you'll see here is the only thing that can be done, and it's, it's the only place we can do it. We can use these ideas everywhere, and we really want you to understand that we're touching at ideas that can be implemented throughout uh, Northampton. Um, we want to start with Main Street. We, we see Main Street, we see all the activity, and it's clearly the hub of the city and, and where all things happen. Um, and we see that there's a lot of stuff there. Well, a lot of the stuff that we see is, is paving uh, and, and uh, cars and you know, all the stuff that we need and we, we make a case for uh, uh, to, to hopefully change over time. But it's actually the fabric of the community. So if we look at that fabric that's expressed through Main Street, there's a lot of good, meaning the, the, the retail edges, the, uh, the living spaces, the, the people, the activity, the, the proximity to the school. Um, but there's also conflicts. There's conflicts with pedestrians and cars and vehicles and bikes. And, and that those are design solutions that need to emerge. So what do, how do we make Main Street the best Main Street that it can be? While well, it all has to accommodate the, the idea of bikes and pedestrians and, and uh, uh, people and, and workplace and education and so forth. So there's several ideas that in play here. One of them is the idea of a shared street, or the idea that you're sharing people and cars. Maybe you're not literally putting them in the same space at the same time, I hope, God, I hope. Um, but you're actually uh, accommodating their needs. And through design, and I can't get into that tonight, what that design is, but through design and, and through your investigations into design, you see that there are ways of potentially uh, slowing cars down, uh, prioritizing uh, pedestrian and bicycle safety, uh, and really sorting through the mix of who needs to be where and making the place the right kind of place. So there are some techniques that we'll document uh, further in the, in the manual, in the, in the book that we're going to leave, leave you with on the concept of shared streets. Complete streets is another idea. It's another idea, I mean, you folks have really kind of moved in this direction, I think, with the idea that you're accommodating zones for cars, for bikes, for pedestrians, and so forth. Um, and this is good because you have to think multi-layered. One of the topics of adaptability is, uh, we think, is is the idea that you really have to, to layer on these uh, interests, and you can't think in isolation. Um, with and with all due respect to anyone involved in bicycling and advocacy for bike for bicycling. We really can't have bike-only systems because they don't exist that way. You know, our natural systems are all complex, and our urban systems are just as complex, but in different ways. So the idea of 
one thing having multiple benefits is something that will, a theme that will resonate through our adaptation planning. And one of these, these adaptation strategies that we have revolves around water. And where water is uh, an ever-increasing threat, both from below, if you will, from flooding, and from above, from increased rainfall, uh, it's very important for us to be able to manage it, to manage it in a way that, that plays nice with the idea of density. When we densify, we're putting in the bad impervious cover that we, we shun, that we should shun. Uh, but the trade-off is that it's a better people place, social, and economic place. The triple bottom line of sustainability has us look at those social and economic issues as well as the environmental issues. So we need to balance the need of nature, the idea of restorative ecologies by building natural systems in our built environment is really what green infrastructure is all about. So there are tools and techniques and processes that we can use that are used elsewhere um, that can really help change the character of the place for the better uh, while bringing nature closer to people in an area where there isn't a lot of it, meaning the downtown area. Tools and techniques such as bump outs for curbs, creating uh, planters that treat stormwater, called rain gardens, bios whales, call them whatever you want. Uh, again, there'll be a toolkit that you can pick from. Uh, many of you are familiar with these technologies. But these treat water, and they're very good at using natural systems to do that. So natural systems adapt and change over time. They respond to the ecological pressures that are there. So a natural system is adaptive by nature. That the, the ecologies that we have today are here because they have adapted over the, the years to be what they are today. Um, accommodating green infrastructure in Main Street. Again, another layer that should, be, that should be considered when we think about how we need to accommodate bikes and pedestrians and vehicles. We need to accommodate nature because that's, pre that's a precious resource that is in short supply in the building environment. Um, ideas about how it can be incorporated in medians and sidewalks, again, narrowed lanes perhaps to make some order out of cars, bikes, pedestrians. We're going to leave the details to you, but these are the issues that we believe need to be addressed. Um, one of the issues, uh, topics that we were challenged with is to think about uh, people, um, people gathering and uh, uh, gathering for the, uh, the idea of the, the, the food uh, resource that's here and the idea of accommodating the farmer's market. So really looking at ways of ex expanding, uh, sorry, expanding the farmer market season by providing a more, I guess, semi-permanent idea of, of, a, uh, of a market. And you know, some ideas about um, uh, structural uh, coverings, um, and, and Tom is the architect, might need to say something here about this, but, <laughs> um, but the idea that, that uh, the place could be uh, more formalized without going over the top. Uh, to, to, to better accommodate more frequent and longer uh, sell, uh, growing selling seasons for, for the agriculture. So, as I mentioned before with the, with the other image, we really zoomed in on an area to talk about what design, how design might uh, manifest in, in an adaptive uh, changing uh, climate, or adapt to a changing climate. And we focused on this area that's highlighted. Uh, really looking at the density of the urban fabric <coughs> and its proximity to the downtown and Main Street. You know, because we're south of down, we're south of Main Street. Um, it's really kind of a, a palette that we can work with to show you some ideas. This doesn't mean that these are the ideas that ought to happen. It's just we need to, 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 to tell you about some principles that we'd like you to, uh, to keep in mind. Uh, part of this is the idea that you have uh, uh, historical resources and, and uh, cultural resources. You have a legacy here, uh, very interesting from my point of view, being an infrastructure guy, um, the legacy of the old uh, Mill River. And it exists right down here, right behind us. Uh, and it's the old meander of the, the river before it was diverted in 1940. 1940, the river was diverted out by uh, Smith out there and uh, diverted around the city to the Oxbow. And it left this remnant of the, uh, the river where a lot of it was filled in, but a lot of it still serves as a drainage channel for the storm drains in the area. So this piece of infrastructure, natural infrastructure, remains. And it turns out that when we poke it out a little bit, it can be quite intriguing with respect to adaptation. Um, we also think that by looking at this particular area, we can engage the communities um, to, to the east uh, and use the idea of this, this flood control infrastructure as a unifying element for the community. Again, looking at leveraging the asset of the, of the infrastructure uh, in a new way. The reason we want to think about leveraging the infrastructure is, as Tom mentioned with his opening statements about the Baltimore infrastructure experience, 
um, we really have an asset here. And many folks don't probably know about it, um, but you're going to need to know about it because it becomes increasingly important as a flood control system and stormwater management in an increasing, in, in while increasing uh, events for storms occur, certainly more important, uh, more frequent events will uh, improve the, uh, increase the risk, uh, potentially. But also that it's an aging infrastructure and you're going to need to reinvest it. And when you do, it would be really helpful if you understood, I think, if you understood what you were buying. Um, so what we're trying to do is to do many things. We're trying to improve function of the, the system itself, and we're trying to improve the uh, increase the awareness of it to, to the public. So there's a way of, of really looking at these systems that have to work a certain way, and as an engineer, you kind of have to figure out how they're supposed to work. But then we want to open our minds up a little bit and say, how could they work? In, how could they work not just for that one thing, the flood control levy resists the flood, and the gates resist the flood, but as I said before, why not consider multiple layers of what else can happen? So these are some examples of some parks uh, that have been built around flood control systems. In Atlanta, the historic Fort Ford Park uh, was created to allow stormwater to rise and fall by, by design uh, at this particular area where flooding was a problem. Uh, around that was designed uh, a, uh, a park. And this is a very dear place now. Similarly, at the University of Virginia, we designed uh, a stormwater park uh, in the, uh, I'm sorry, a stormwater pond within the park that is now a beloved asset for the community about 10 years after it's been built. And again, this system, this park system is more than just a pond. It's calibrated with function. It's the idea that it works a certain way, and we can calculate how much is needed to fluctuate, how much discharge is made downstream and all of that, which are, from an engineering point of view, things to consider. So our big idea, as an example, is to think about this infrastructure, this legacy uh, system of pond, uh, river, and modify it a bit so it works a little differently, and I'll leave all the details in the report. Modify it by, control, uh, by installing what's called an outward control structure so that it limits the amount of that gets into the, the uh, culvert system that carries it down to the levee and thereby pop a uh, ponding water up into the, uh, the old river bed where, where it used to be. And you know, my colleagues, Tom, had, my colleagues, my colleagues, Tom, uh, and I kind of noodled on the idea of, okay, well, well, what can we do here? Well, we have a blank slate, literally. You can make a park, you can make it a passive park, an active park, and these are just some, some ideas. Uh, uh, instead of Tom Legging sleeping yesterday, he did this. Uh, you know, came up with ideas of what this area might look like. It's really an asset for this part of the, of the town, of the city. And it's something that's very unusual and, and perhaps very much needed uh, for uh, recreation and so forth. So ideas about what it might look like, how you might build it, what it might do, how much fluctuation, you know, stormwater control it might need to do and so forth, all of which would have to be penciled out, of course. So really what we're looking for out of our green infrastructure adaptation response is several things. There are many things, but I, I, I zoomed in on these three, one of which was already discussed earlier. But we are concerned about uh, a number of things. The first I've listed is increasing frequency of storm events. Well, what should we do about it? What we really should do about it is, is think about stormwater management, the systems that we've got, and probably expand them if we're going to have uh, increased uh, events. So the way we do that is we think about different ways of, instead of just upgrading pipes, for example, that might carry the water down to the river faster and get it out of, out of our way, uh, one, of the, one of the techniques that's used in green infrastructure is to hold water up within the watershed and to hold water where it, where it falls so that it can contact the ground and be taken up by the plants and dissipate on its own prior to becoming runoff. So these ideas of distributing water back up in the neighborhood is really a kind of natural restoration process. And we really need to reinforce and reinvest in our existing infrastructures because they are aging. Along with the number of events that are increasing, the intensity is increasing. And we, we really need to, to pull apart, and I don't want to get too technical here, but we need to pull apart the, the design experience and the design criteria that are being applied to recognize a, a, an increased risk in the future. So we need, to, we need to suggest that what you want to think about is adopting updated design criteria that not only involves using natural systems such as green infrastructure, which manage water very well by design, by nature, 
um, but also poke at the criteria that's been used for a number of years as to whether the design criteria is adequately reflecting, reflecting today's rainfall trends as well as tomorrow's projections. And then we talked about um, earlier, I think uh, Rachel talked about the idea of uh, the, the natural systems themselves and how we can be preemptive about uh, uh, putting in the right species and not only installing the right species and maintaining the right species, but watching out for the bad species that we don't want, the invasive species. Because your invasive species that are here today and, and you, you can manage may change. And with, with climate change, uh, the, the regime of those plant uh, uh, communities uh, will, will change too. Not just the good ones, but the ones you want to keep up. All right, so this, these, are, these are just some uh, slides about how to do what we need to do. And these will be explored in the, uh, uh, in the, in the report. But it says, essentially says distribute these solutions out in the watershed, such as what we're proposing, not we're proposing, such as what we're illustrating at the old Mill River uh, way here. Again, optimizing the existing infrastructure. You can't blast it and start over. You wouldn't want to do that. Upgrade what you can, what you need to, and, and get the best out of it for a changing future. With regard to changing storm intensity, it, it's very interesting to note that the criteria that the engineers use today was developed back in 1961. This is the rainfall records from back in 1961. And those records were only taken for a period of about 25 years. So in 1961, going back to 1930 something, that was the rainfall that we, that we still use today. So they observed that rainfall pattern, and we're still designing the pipes and the systems the same way today. So there's a new way of looking at it, which is kind of with our processing capabilities for our data, you know, almost infinite data collection capabilities, our ability to process data, rainfall data, everywhere, anywhere, anytime, collect all of that and use more current rainfall data, and just to evaluate some of these alternative ways of looking at it. Now, if we put in a rolling system, meaning that we're going to be evaluating rainfall that happens today, uh, and that today keeps moving, it means we're going to at least keep up with what's happening through today. We are 50 years behind, okay, and that's not a good place to be for, for climate change. There are systems such as LEED and Sustainable Sites Initiative that provide a new approach, a new way of looking at ecological rainfall, and I've listed them here, and, and we can get into detail uh, during the report. And again, the natural conditions that we've already mentioned. Um, okay, so kind of switching gears a little bit, the, the, the uh, design involves a gateway to the, uh, to, to the community from the south, and we're suggesting that the gateway can be centered on the infrastructure that's there, the, the, the levee gate system, literally a gateway. Um, so, you know, a celebration of the system that's there, understanding why it's there, and certainly not waiting for catastrophe, catastrophe to prove its value. Um, doing, uh, expanding your path systems through the area. Again, treating this area as a piece of found land. It's a found land as an asset, and, and really looking at the development of the corridor along Pleasant as an opportunity to densify the community the way that we want to downtown and adapt to the new needs for housing and workplace that is uh, within the community. So the, again, these principles can be applied on King Street and, and anywhere else. We're just suggesting that we're drawing the energy from downtown and pulling it in one direction or another, or many directions. Um, ideas about what this uh, corridor might look like, the idea of a variety of uh, Housing space, uh, a workspace, uh, physical form is different. The idea that you're creating a streetscape, uh, very much like downtown, uh, but providing the articulation of, of uh, design through uh, architecture that uh, makes the place interesting. And we included this because Tom, <coughs> colleague Tom, is a is a wonderful artist and uh, couldn't find any other use for this beautiful sketch of his. So we just wanted to celebrate <laughs> some of the talent that's here tonight. <laughs> So it's important that actually that it's you know that it is actually things we have to recognize is the value of the historic heritage here and that part of what you know as we're looking into the future after acknowledge the past and what makes Northampton um, the Northampton it is, is is recognize the history and we have to uh, not discard that past. So as we're going to summarize quickly here a couple of things. Now what? Where do we go from here? Couple basic recommendations. First question: What are we doing here? Why, you know, what are the community vulnerability assessments? How can we figure out how we can do um, 
better for what we have here and identify vulnerable populations and vulnerabilities to the, the broader civic infrastructure. Talk amongst yourselves. Let's talk amongst yourselves. Once again, it's very important that we uh, communicate amongst one another and identify what those priorities are. Waste equals food. You know, one of the things that, that, that Andre so eloquently uh, described in great detail is capturing waste to eat and repurposing it is the ultimate form of recycling. And rather than literally dumping it down the drain, reclaiming that is, is a phenomenal source of free, free energy. Celebrate green infrastructure. Once again, you know, you guys have done such great things as a community to protect it. Uh, the fact that we've tried to hide that infrastructure rather than really celebrate the, the civic engagement and, and the involvement that to do that is, is sort of seems to be a lost opportunity um, that could be highlighted, especially as we're getting ready to invest more money. Um, it's important to identify that what you're doing. So you actually say when you're putting money uh, putting that money forward that you're actually getting something out of it. Go to zero. Uh, a whole other section of the report you'll see is the notion about what could you do to, could, to go to net zero energy, uh, net zero water. Uh, the city has certainly become a leader uh, in terms of promoting that and hopefully incentivizing private sector investments as well too. Um, don't forget, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it, why it's important to call out uh, the importance of the infrastructure so we don't have another flood. Uh, that uh, we acknowledge what's happened in the past here. Uh, long life, loose fit, one of the key uh, attributes of AIA's committed environment is designing for future flexibility. We can't project into the future too far. We need to make sure that the systems we're designing and the infrastructure we're designing and the city we're planning for can, uh, can accommodate future change even though we don't know what that future is. And lastly, uh, the idea of double duty, triple duty, infinite duty that Everything we're investing here, if we're going to be doing a streetscape improvement, make sure it's also taking care of storm, stormwater quality, make sure it's also uh, improving the pedestrian experience, the bicycling experience, uh, hopefully also even adding additional beauty to the community, that, that we can't uh, forget that every time we are inserting something, installing something, building something, it can be an object of beauty uh, and an object uh, to celebrate. And with that, actually, before we go to questions and answers for a few minutes here, I'd like to see if the mayor would like to have, have offer any closing comments. Come on up. <laughs> oh, <you're right. laughs> Not to put you on the spot, but we're going to. Okay. Well, I mainly, my closing comments are really to, and I hope you'll join me in thanking this incredible team that's assembled here tonight. Um, this is a they, they may not have said this or disclosed this, but these are all volunteers. They're, they're doing this as all volunteers. <laughs> obviously a big shout out also to the American Institute of Architects um, who funded this, this project for us. It helped fund bringing these experts here, helping us go through this process. I also want to thank all of you and all those folks who couldn't be here, who participated in all of the focus groups, all the smaller groups that were done. Um, and I want to thank all of our city departments uh, that, that also were part of this process. Obviously, uh, Planning and Sustainability, our Health Department, Department of Public Works, um, our Fire and Emergency uh, Police, Emergency Management um, Departments, uh, Building Inspector, uh, even the mayor's office got involved a little bit. Uh, and, um, and those departments are going to be critical as we move forward in continuing this conversation. This is really, you know, you've sparked some great conversation points and things that we're going to have to take a look at. Those departments are going to have to take a look at them. We've also got some boards, our planning board, uh, our Energy and Sustainability Commission. You know, City Council may have to look at some things. Um, and obviously, I'll be looking at them. So thank you for all this work. I stopped by your your workspace, and um, it was quite impressive. You know, things on the wall, you know, uh, multiple computers. Uh, he's drawing away like crazy. Uh, and um, just what an incredible process. 72 hours, land on a Sunday, um, sort of descend on the community, and then you know, that's so thank you very much. Um, so one of the 
of the great frustrations we had is we are running so tight on time right now, and we we've edited out a great deal of stuff that we already came up with, and other folks here came up with. Uh, so if we have left you with a lot of questions, then we clearly haven't done our job. But in the interest of uh, seeing what we come up with here, we have one or two questions that you'd like to try and answer here. Somebody? Anybody? Yes, ma'am. I will say something. I'm so pleased that you talked about uh, Pleasant Street because that is uh, a street that we've been talking about a lot in, in redeveloping it. And your um, concentration on it will, I think, help provide a lot of opportunities for us a lot of conversations about what can happen there. So thank you. I'd also like to point out, as we were saying along here, we use that as a case study. It's not to say, oh, we need to go to Pleasant Street immediately. It's a, there's some great opportunities there, but the same uh, opportunities exist on King Street in terms of you have undeveloped parcels there. It could really be something. Uh, and throughout the broader community, it's, it's, it, we just had to pick one or two areas to test out some ideas. But this really should be broadcast. And as they will be successful, share with your neighbors to make sure that other communities around here are also starting to embrace some of these ideas as well. Yes, sir. Um, do you know if there's any policy frameworks out there that that require communities to look at multiple uses for certain projects? You know, like, it's like you close on, you know, this idea of infinity, uh, infinite use or something. Is there policy, policy frameworks that, that require sort of review of um, multiple uses of something? Um, I think the opposite is true, really. I think the, the <laughs> focus, yeah. the idea of focus really is, is like siloed almost. That <coughs> interests, special interests, a certain uh, limited interests emerge and those become single issues. I think the challenge really is to broaden the conversation. Like I said, as an example, I really don't need to pick on any white people. But I rode a bike in the, uh, the second place on wall today. Um, Can you speak up? Yes, I, again, you missed another joke. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I really didn't. No, you didn't. I'm, I'm just suggesting that um, you know, advocacy is wonderful, and advocacy for one point might be short-sighted with regard to the potential benefits gained by broadening the conversation. But I can't think of any policies that really broaden the points of view. I'm kind of, the more I talk about it, thinking that sustainable design systems do that. They require you to look at a host of things, but that's far from policy. Thank you. There are some frameworks and things like lead for neighborhood development looks at, if you want to pursue a high level of lead certification, it compels you to look at not just that neighborhood, but its adjacencies, its connections, and how you can uh, maximize the utility of, of your investments. Other questions, other thoughts? Yes, ma'am. I'll just make a, an observation. We just adopted this new stormwater fee last year. We have a very well-documented long-term need for some major investments in stormwater. And I don't think your presentation could have come at a most, more time to point. Because we're doing, we've just adopted that fee. We're going to start making some decisions about where we are going to allocate those resources. And to do them in an integrated fashion that pushes everybody's buttons to really make the downtown and the community as a whole sustainable and adapting to the new reality, I think it's really valuable. So talking about the, sort of the importance of uh, looking at how you can maximize the value in your investments. Uh, for those of you here Monday night, you heard me talk about, you know, one of the things that drives me nuts is when you spend a lot of money, you bury a, you know, bury a pipe in the ground, keep picking up pipes, but, and you never see it again. You know, that sort of, once you're doing that level of, of um, investment, you should be trying to figure out what else you can get out of it, what are the additional ancillary uses you can get out of it to make it a thing of beauty. And sort of, once again, just to acknowledge the investments going in there. And one other thought about infrastructure, and the fact that people will always complain about why are we you know, putting all this money into it. How many other things can you bury in the ground for 100 years and have it continue to function day in and day out? If you do it right. If you do it right. And so certainly as you're getting ready to in, you know, make this new investment after you know decades of service, Make sure you do it right because the goal is that your great grandkids will be wrestling with you know these issues a long time from now. Other questions? Going once, going twice. Ooh. One last question, and that'll be it. Sorry. Yes, sir. Um, but I love the idea of the wastewater heat. Is there other examples of you know what, sorry heat recovery from wastewater lines, uh, sewage lines? Are there examples of cities uh, retrofitting those systems in the U.S. Of the scale, of cities of the scale. Uh, it's uh, 
not aware in the in the U.S. but in uh, Vancouver, Canada, uh, when they uh, had the Winter Olympics, the Olympic uh, village there is actually heated and cooled from from uh, the same kind of concept. And uh, to use uh, the uh, wastewater system for for energy. Uh, actually, I did it back in the 80s in Sweden. So it's it's a new technology as such. It's more that it fits into to, uh, what we're doing here in the U.S. now, and uh, that we are really trying to reduce the the fossil fuel use. And then this is te technologies that's proven for a long time, and uh, they will definitely help to reduce the the car carbon footprint. And you guys are truly are leaders in the country. I you know, recognize that you are the first five-star community in the country. Third. So we, we did, you know, so uh, we, we did come a little behind you guys. But still, you know, you guys are leaders. And from that standpoint, hasn't been done before. Does mean you can't start here? With that, uh, I'm going to say... I didn't get to talk. I'm <laughs> logging <laughs> really enjoy this process and I just wanted to uh, a final comment to state that it really is a good process and it works. I've seen it work in, in uh, 20, 30 communities across the country and I'd like to thank the AIA for doing that. The people that uh, from the AIA that helped support the team on, on uh, some of the recommendations and kept us honest in terms of uh, what's happened here in the past including, of course, yourselves, did that job as well. Uh, anyway, I'm a, uh, an architect in Nebraska, but, uh, and I taught at the University of Nebraska for many, many years, now I'm Harris. I really enjoyed your community. You've got a rich, rich heritage, architectural heritage. I think it makes the community an absolutely wonderful uh, walking community. It has that potential, uh, the architectural heritage, very, very rich. This was a rewarding trip for me.